Kissinger was also tough and ruthless. He had started in the 1950s as an expert in the theory of nuclear strategy, what was called the delicate balance of terror. It was the system that ran the Cold War. Both sides believed that if they attacked, the other side would immediately launch their missiles and everyone would be annihilated. Kissinger had been one of the models for the character of Dr. Strangelove in Stanley Kubrick's film. Mr. President, I would not rule out the chance to preserve a nucleus of human specimens. It would be quite easy. <laughs> At the bottom of uh, some of our deeper minds, sir. Uh... Henry was not a warm, friendly, modest, jovial sort of person. He was thought of as one of the more uh, anxious, temperamental, self-conscious, ambitious, inconsiderate people at Harvard. Kissinger saw himself as a hard realist. He had no time for the emotional turmoil of political ideologies. He believed that history had always really been a struggle for power between groups and nations. But what Kissinger took from the Cold War was a way of seeing the world as an interconnected system. And his aim was to keep that system in balance and prevent it from falling into chaos. I believe that with all the dislocations we know, now experience, there also exists an extraordinary opportunity to form for the first time in history a truly global society carried by the principle of interdependence. And if we act wisely and with vision, I think we can look back to all this turmoil as the birth pangs of a more creative and better system. If we miss the opportunity, I think there's going to be chaos. The flight has been delayed, we understand now. The Kissinger will be arriving here about um, an hour and a half from now. So we'll just get the, uh, have the press informed and then we'll stay in contact with you. And it was this idea that Kissinger set out to impose on the chaotic politics of the Middle East. But to manage it, he knew that he was going to have to deal with President Assad of Syria. President Assad was convinced that there would only ever be a real and lasting peace between the Arabs and Israel if the Palestinian refugees were allowed to return to their homeland. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were living in exile in Syria, as well as in the Lebanon and Jordan. Have you found that the Palestinians here want to integrate with the Syrians at oh, all? Oh, no, no, never. Why? They don't want not here or neither in Lebanon or in Jordan, never. No, because they want to, to stay as, as a whole, as a Palestinian, as a, and they call themselves those who go back, El Aidun in, in, in Arabic. Assad also believed that such a peace would strengthen the Arab world. But Kissinger thought that strengthening the Arabs would destabilize his balance of power. So he set out to do the very opposite, to fracture the power of the Arab countries by dividing them and breaking their alliances so they would keep each other in check. Kissinger now played a double game, or as he termed it, constructive ambiguity. In a series of meetings, he persuaded Egypt to sign a separate agreement with Israel. But at the same time, he led Assad to believe that he was working for a wider peace agreement, one that would include the Palestinians. In reality, the Palestinians were ignored. They were irrelevant to the structural balance of the global system. The hallmark of, of Kissinger's thinking about international politics is its structural design. Everything is always connected in his mind to everything else. But his first thoughts are on that level, on the structural global balance of power level. 
And as he addresses uh, questions of human dignity, human survival, human freedom, I think they tend to come into his mind as an adjunct of the play of nations at the power game. When Assad found out the truth, it was too late. In a series of confrontations with Kissinger in Damascus, Assad raged about this treachery. He told Kissinger that what he had done would release demons hidden under the surface of the Arab world. Kissinger described their meetings. Assad's controlled fury, he wrote, was all the more impressive for its eerily cold, seemingly unemotional demeanor. Assad now retreated. He started to build a giant palace that loomed over Damascus. And his belief that it would be possible to transform the Arab world began to fade. A British journalist who knew Assad wrote, Assad's optimism has gone. A trust in the future has gone. What has emerged instead is a brutal, vengeful Assad who believes in nothing except revenge.